All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Aaron Upton. We're in McMinnville. It's July 2nd, 2021. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the most important question, which is why wine? Mm. Wine, yes. Well, other than it is delicious and wonderful to drink, um, I guess I always connected wine with place. And um, I came to an interest in wine and, and working in wine a little bit later in life, in my early 30s, I guess. Um, and I originally grew up in McMinnville here in Oregon in the Willamette Valley, um, but had no um, connection with or knowledge of or uh, engagement with the wine industry or, or the wine region at the time. Um, but I, I guess later, um, returning to Oregon, ha having gone a, and lived in, in other areas and other parts of the country and other countries, um, I came back and uh, have just been fascinated about the connection um, between, uh, I guess one of my, pa my passions has always been um, learning about the connection between people and place. And that really happens um, in wine in different mm -hmm. regions around the world, but also here in my home landscape. So that was kind of my original uh, curiosity where the seed was planted. All right, well, you mentioned uh, life before wine. Tell me about uh, kind of life after high school. Life after high school, yeah, okay. So born and raised in McMinnville, was pretty excited to leave <laughs> <laughs> and just to have other experiences. Um, so I didn't go too far uh, originally. I went down the road to Eugene and went to college undergrad in Eugene. Um, and had some really wonderful experiences. I studied uh, international studies and French. Um, I spent a year in Lyon, France, um, which I guess is another, it was a, my first intro to wine, um, was living in Lyon and um, living with a French family and being a 19 year old uh, who didn't have any background in wine and um, just experiencing wine as um, part of daily life, um, had with meals, um, got to pick grapes in the Beaujolais uh, with a friend, uh, just had it, it was integrated in with the culture and um, was really connected with food and with um, coming together and dining together and celebrating together. So that was probably my first exposure to thinking of, of wine as kind of this cultural experience um, in addition to just a beverage that you would consume. Um, and then after um, my experience in college undergrad, um, I actually moved to New York City and I worked in the nonprofit arts sector. Um, I worked for uh, the American Academy in Rome, which is um, an institution that is based in Rome, Italy, um, but has its offices in New York. And we um, awarded fellowships to artists and scholars uh, in the humanities to go live and work in Rome, Italy. Um, and through that, I was exposed to the field of landscape architecture. We awarded fellowships in that field. Um, I was running the juries uh, for this juried competition, so I got to meet a bunch of uh, folks in these different fields. And one of them was meeting professional landscape architects and landscape architectural scholars fell in love with that, as I mentioned before, that kind of learning about the connection between people and place. Um, so I ended up going uh, back to school for a master's in landscape architecture in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. Um, so spent a number of years in BC, um, lived in the Netherlands, and eventually made my way back to New York City where I worked um, in Manhattan and lived in Brooklyn and worked for a landscape architecture firm in New York. Um, and I guess that was also um, a time that I started making connections between and becoming much more interested in um, food systems mm -hmm. and agriculture, mm -hmm. which was kind of a little bit of a funny thing because I was living, you know, in a very urban space, urban environment, but my office building was um, in uh, Union Square and they in Manhattan and they had just an amazing farmers market the green market a pretty famous farmers market in New York um, multiple days um, a week so I would actually uh, started learning more about uh, where my food was coming from and the stories of the farmers mm -hmm. and connecting kind of food with place um, so got deeply interested into reading and listening to lectures and um, exploring kind of the different regional foodways and 
I had this great experience. Um, it was my 30th birthday, so a dozen years ago, and saved up money to go have a special meal um, for my birthday. We went to lunch because it was a pretty spendy, probably this, the most <laughs> spendy lunch I <laughs> had to date at, at that time. And um, it was up at a restaurant called Blue Hill Stone Barns, and it was um, just outside of the city. Um, it's on the Rockefeller estate, but there's a chef um, named Dan Barber who had created this, and it was a real farm-to-table experience. The farm was right there on the property. You could walk around and uh, learn about where your food was, was coming from and then, and then have this really magnificent meal there. But the, the connection with wine was that um, they, that was also the first meal I ever had where they had a sommelier come and present the wine list to you. And the guy came over and was uh, sharing what the wine options were. And there was wine from uh, Oregon on the list. There was a Willamette Valley wine. And I can't remember what it was, but I remember he mispronounced uh, the name of the Willamette Valley. And so uh, I just was visiting with him and shared, you know, oh, that's my home landscape, that's where I grew up. And so we had a little chat about that. And I thought to myself later, like, wow, there's Oregon wine showing up on the wine list and, you know, this really renowned and wonderful restaurant out in New York. So that was kind of fun to make that link and connection back to my personal uh, origin mm -hmm. <laughs> place. Mm -hmm. um, and then to write, um, in, I guess it was 2010, uh, moved back west and was really um, interested in, in being back in Oregon and um, being more connected with this place where I had um, grown up. We're talking about being connected. What, were you th what was the, the plan when you came back? Yeah. Um, so I had planned to stay working in the landscape architecture field. Um, and it was 2010, it was during the recession, and um, landed in Portland and started kind of doing the rounds of informational interviews and looking for work. And um, it really, uh, yeah, it was challenging at the time. Um, so I kind of decided that maybe it would be a good time to just pick up some part-time work while I was continuing to look for, for this uh, more full-time gig. And I had been really curious, having come back to visit my folks a lot in McMinnville um, through the time I'd been away, and um, had seen really the, the, the growth and the blossoming and the development of the wine industry here, and um, gone out a couple times with my parents to do tastings. And so I thought, oh, it might be kind of interesting to learn more about this. Um, this industry um, and just maybe take a part-time job in a tasting room um, while I look for, you know, this other job. And it ended up um, uh, blossoming into something I didn't anticipate. And so I did get um, a part-time job in a tasting room at Anami um, Vineyards outside of um, Carleton. And that quickly turned into a full-time job and I worked um, for about four and a half years at that winery. Um, originally as their direct sales manager, tasting room manager, running the wine club, and then later transitioning into um, kind of more behind the scenes, I was their operations manager um, during that time. And during that time, I um, actually moved out and lived on Ribbon Ridge um, on the Chehala Mountain. And um, so I was really living in the heart of where a lot of vineyard development was going on as well. Um, during that time. So I learned a lot from the inside of uh, working inside the industry. Um, and that was a great place to work because of the um, just openness of and collaborative nature. Um, you could wander into the cellar any day, even if you were front of house and ask them, what are you up to today? What are you, what's going on in the winemaking process? So I got to learn a lot about um, what, the, what was going on in the cellar, the, the winemaking side of things, and then also because there's a vineyard on the site where the winery and the tasting room is, and there were other vineyard um, properties um, under that ownership, um, also got to learn a, a lot about the farming side as well. Mm -hmm. So it was just a great exposure and introduction to um, kind of the whole, uh, th yeah, the, the, all of the components that were, were part of uh, having a, a winery in the Willamette Valley. What was your initial impression of the Oregon wine industry and, and of the work you were doing in it? Yeah, um, 
Well, it was all new to me, so I was kind of in sponge mode, just wanting to learn. Um, I found that people were really open. Um, there was like a real sense of community. Um, uh, and I think that there was also, um, let's see, this was, I don't know, how long ago? A dozen years ago, so it wasn't, um, or maybe less, 10 years ago. Um, so yeah, it, I, I think it, I get the impression that it's shifted and changed a, changed a little bit since since that, even that time, but um, yeah, I had a sense of this kind of, I mean, people use the term co that people really worked together, even though they might, um, you know, be competitors in the marketplace. Um, so if something went wrong with your harvest or you had an issue or, you know, something happened in someone's family, somebody passed away and they needed a, extra assistance, you know, there would always be um, kind of a gathering together and a coalescing of, um, of the community to, to, to really be there for each other and work together. So that was my impression of the industry when I first started out. What about the wine? I'm curious about your impressions of Oregon wine and, and, and of selling it. What were the, what were the, the, what were the challenges of selling wine? <laughs> well, I don't know. It wasn't particularly, actually, I feel like the, for me at the beginning, I didn't have any background in wine, so I was learning. Um, uh, but in a way that was a little bit useful um, when engaging with people in the tasting room because there were a lot of people who were coming into the tasting room who also didn't know too much. And I feel like it was nice to, to be able to meet people where they were. So if they, um, you know, if they were, if they wanted to know, um, you know, who the cooper was for the barrel, I could tell them that. But if they just wanted to, um, you know, learn a little bit or maybe even just a visit with the people that they came with and enjoy the nice view, it just seemed like an opportunity to um, engage with visitors um, in the way that they, you know, they wanted to, to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we, um, we're trying to build, we were trying to build a group that was a friendly, engaging staff that was welcoming and warm, um, and that we had a great product to work with, which really helped. Um, and we had, you know, a beautiful site with beautiful views. People love to come and visit just for the location too, and the landscape and the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think some of the challenges maybe were, um, you know, it was variable in terms of um, what we had to sell and how much we had to sell. And honestly, I was often, you know, um, dueling with the uh, the national sales folks who wanted more wine for their markets, <laughs> and we wanted to keep more in the tasting room. So just little stuff like that. But it wasn't it wasn't too big of a deal. <sighs> what did you find, I guess, alluring about? the industry or, or learning about working with wine. You mentioned kind of part-time job between things turning into a four and a half year at, just at the same place. Why? What, what kept you? Mm. Yeah, you know, I also continued to do landscape design work on the side. I started my own little business and did, um, so I was still kind of scratching that design itch a little bit, um, mostly doing residential work. But um, yeah, I, I was really, uh, during that time, I was, I was curious kind of of where this was going to go and maybe what the next steps were. As you kind of alluded, I kind of fell into something that wasn't necessarily my plan. Um, and really sales and marketing was not my background or particularly my interest. Um, my interest was always in this connection between people and place. And so I became really interested in thinking about um, what is this place? What is this region? What is, um, you know, wine country, we never called it that when I was growing up here. Um, and what did it mean for this place, this transformation that was happening? I, as I observed that the, you know, the industry was growing, the landscape was changing, um, the culture was changing. Um, and I didn't necessarily have, um, it wasn't that that was good or that was bad. I was just really curious about it. Um, so that really planted the seed during those years as I was working um, at Anami to, um, I wanted to I wanted to learn more and I was I was curious to learn beyond just um, one winery and, and mm -hmm. one vineyard site um, so that planted the seed for me to want to go back to school and pursue my PhD and do some research around some some questions that had really started coming up mm -hmm. for me 
Tell me what you mentioned kind of the, the overall, what, what, if you could boil it down to one question or one set of questions, what was it you were trying to, to get at? What was the sort of the heart of the, of the research you wanted to do? <laughs> oh, boil it down. That's always challenging. Um, I guess the, the one word that I was curious about exploring was transformation. So that had some, you know, sub points to it. It could be landscape transformation and how we experience place. Mm -hmm. So what was this place uh, looking like, feeling like, what was it like when you were moving through it, when you were living here, when you were visiting here? Um, and then I was also s curious about the social transformation. Um, so I think a lot of what I would hear around the talk around um, the wine industry was the wine industry is really great for the Willamette Valley. It's really positive for Oregon. It's really wonderful for the economy. And I started being curious, like, okay, yeah, I can totally see that. And also like whose economy and who is it benefiting? And um, so I was really interested in some of the social um, aspects of the transformation and growth of the wine industry. And then I was also really curious about some of the ecological um, uh, transformation that was happening in the region. So what does it mean to, um, you know, plant a vineyard? Uh, what does it mean for, you know, habitat or biodiversity? Or what does it mean for growing um, wine grapes um, on farmland? Uh, it was just like lots of questions for me around. And again, it wasn't that this is bad or this is good. It was just a curiosity mm -hmm. of what what is this? Mm -hmm. um, so those were maybe kind of the three buckets of areas around transformation. Mm -hmm. And I guess just to add to the social one too is that I did see that there was consolidation happening and that there was outside interest from outside regions and um, and people coming to this this region specifically in the Lamet Valley. Um, and I was really curious about what that meant too um, for the cultural transformation for the for the experience of place. So those were some of the themes I was. And I'll just one little anecdote about. Um, I had a hard time explaining this when I first talk, started talking about it with people because they didn't, they, well, th so what I was experiencing up on Ribbon Ridge, um, I had this neighbor who I would walk to her place and um, buy eggs from her. And she had lived on the ridge for over three decades. And so she had seen a lot of transformation on that ridge. Um, it was, you know, predominantly some farmland and timber, um, and a lot of vineyards had been going in. And there had been vineyards there as well, um, uh, up on um, on the ridge for 30 years too. So it wasn't that it, they weren't there before, but they just were growing and expanding. And um, and she was commenting, we had been seeing a lot of animals that year, like larger animals, like. I saw a bear, which I think was pretty rare for Ribbon Ridge on my driveway, but we would see bobcat and you would see, um, I know up at Brick House, they were seeing um, uh, cougars. There was, there was just kind of more, uh, so I was curious, like, is this normal? And I was asking my neighbor, Sue, is, have you, cause she had small animals, um, like sheep and, and goats and stuff like that. And so she would say, yeah, occasionally we would have a predator kill mm -hmm. a farm animal. Um, uh, so they ha they are always around, but she was uh, n under the impression that we were seeing more of them because more vineyards were going in and the eight foot um, deer fencing that was going in to protect the vineyard um, was actually causing these animals to be more um, in like there was corridors that they they were ma mainly on the road more because they didn't have us free of passage mm -hmm. through the landscape. And so that was just one little example where I thought, ah, that's so interesting, like this cultural decision that we've made as, mm -hmm. as humans to plant a vineyard and put up a fence, like has transformed mm -hmm. um, this ridge and the, um, maybe the ecology or maybe the, you know, the wildlife behavior. And I didn't, again, I didn't have any conclusions about it. I just thought, huh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So that was, kind of one thing that sent me on my trajectory of the type of research I ended up doing later. Did you find that anybody else was studying what you were studying? Did you run across anyone else with sort of a similar study background at that point? No. <laughs> Just, <laughs> pioneering, pioneering. I don't know if you call it pioneering, but no, I definitely did not. <laughs> I mean, sure, people were certainly interested in kind of, you know, um, 
there's lots of there, there's lots of interest and overlap in things like land use um, around natural resource management around kind of the sociology of rural landscapes um, you know, the meaning of place I'm definitely not you know this is not original thinking but I think maybe some of the connections that I was making for that specific place at that specific time I mm -hmm. yeah I didn't really find anybody else who was digging into that mm -hmm. um, that I found that doesn't mean they weren't there but so once this is as this is sort of coming into fruition here tell me what and you're thinking you want to go back and you want to study this uh, so what's the next step for you and how do you find how do you find the way to make that happen yeah good question it's not it's not super easy um, to find your way forward in a PhD program. It was completely new to me. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Um, I just started doing some networking and some um, some informational interviewing. I did a lot of research into um, you know who was doing what kind of in the academic world and I really didn't have any academic training or background. My master's degree was a design degree. It was a really different type of mm -hmm. approach to scholarship. Um, so I knew, well, I had a couple of criteria. I knew I wanted to stay in the region. Um, I knew that I wanted to research what I wanted to research. So there's kind of two models um, in higher ed if you're doing a PhD. And one is that either you find your own funding and you do your own independent research with mentorship and with a committee and all of that um, within the, the university, or you go and work with a, a professor who has their own funding and they, you know, you work on their research. And both are great models. I just knew for myself that I wanted my independence to pursue the research that I was curious about. Um, which at that time was still really fuzzy, exactly what it was <laughs> that I was curious about. Um, so anyway, I just, I, it was just a lot of luck and a lot of good timing and um, just kind of winning the life lottery. I ended up um, finding a program um, at Portland State University in Portland. Um, and I met with a couple of different professors up there who were in different departments. Um, I met with somebody in anthropology, I met with somebody in the urban planning department, and I met with somebody in the environmental studies department. And all three of these people happened to be part of a National Science Foundation grant um, that Portland State had. Um, and I was able to um, get a fellowship through that grant money. Um, and I ended up working with all three of those professors. I ended up landing in the environmental science and management department, um, working with uh, my advisor, Max Nielsen Pincus, um, who he would, I think, describe himself as an environmental sociologist. So although we were in the environmental sciences department, we were doing social science um, and also a lot of interdisciplinary work. And so meaning, um, across disciplines so it wasn't sometimes you'd work with natural scientists sometimes you'd work with economists sometimes you'd work with climate scientists it just it was it was um, a whole range of folks um, who were working collaboratively usually on uh, questions I hear a hummingbird zooming by uh, <laughs> right by my ear um, uh, you know questions that are complex that maybe one person can't answer with their research but I could get back to, to that kind of approach, which is really interesting to me. But the getting in, it just was lucky. I was able to um, um, get this funding, which was major, um, and then land in a department, which was, it, people weren't doing wine research there. Um, there is a, a well-known um, geologist who does work around um, you've probably interviewed him, Scott Burns, who's at Portland State or emeritus now, but he does a lot of work around soil um, and, and wine regions. And so he's in the geography department there, um, but l l not many folks were studying anything about wine. Um, and my advisor actually does, his, his research is predominant, he does a variety of things, but predominantly around wildfire and, and um, community. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was really on my own to be able to pursue um, the particular topic that I wanted to yet I had plenty of support and guidance around approach methodology like how to do scholarship all of it was completely new to me I often joke that it was like being an exchange student where you go into an institution or a place with, that's using completely different language completely different culture and I certainly felt um, like I was from a different planet <laughs> when I landed in academia luckily um, 
part of my fellowship was um, built into it through the National Science Foundation was this interdisciplinary component. And so early on, um, you take courses, and all of my coursework was, um, a, a lot of my coursework that was required was interdisciplinary in nature. So it was students who were natural scientists and social scientists and professors who were natural mm -hmm. scientists and social scientists, often co-teaching courses. So I think that people who are drawn to that kind of inquiry and scholarship um, already check their egos a little bit at the door because if you come into something saying, I am the expert in this, listen to me, um, that doesn't really work so well in an interdisciplinary environment. And so um, oftentimes it attracts people, I think, who are already um, pretty open to hearing about different ways of thinking, mm -hmm. different ways of approaching, and to really truly approach things in a collaborative nature. and. Those people are super awesome and fun to be around. And so I had a really positive experience with mm -hmm. the culture of mm -hmm. being back in school, which I, I know is not always what people experience mm -hmm. in their PhD programs, mm -hmm. which often I hear can be isolating and, and you know, demoralizing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I had the opposite experience. It's good to hear. I know. <laughs> I was pretty lucky. And to get funding, it was just, it just, oh, sorry. That's just Good. Um, it just was really, it was really exciting, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I can elaborate a little bit about the um, the path that that took me. Then about more about the wine sure. um, direction. I do have one question before you start. Yeah. Then we'll take you on that path. I'm curious. You you, you go in and, you, and the, you have this idea in your head, and it's your your study, your research, and you have all these people around who can help, but but none of them really know exactly. So what's you have a goal when you come in. What's what's your what's your idea of I'm gonna I will have succeeded if this has happened. Um, I don't think I would frame it that way. Um, I came in very open, um, and I didn't quite know what I would find or where it would take me, um, which is I realize how I approach a lot of things, <laughs> which. In the end, it works for me, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I have had a lot of um, shifts and um, taken off in new directions professionally, um, but it's been amazing. It's everything has, has, has linked because I think I stay open to, I don't know what I don't know yet, and when I discover it, it might lead me down this whole new path that is really um, interesting and engaging. and. I'm just deeply curious and I just want to feel those uh, feelings mm -hmm. <laughs> in my work and in my life. And so um, I didn't have some, okay, if I discover this, then I'll know. I actually didn't quite know what my research question was. I knew I had this kind of fuzzy, I must have at least had some way of stating it to you know the application review committees because I mean somebody said ah this but this has value you should come do this <laughs> it feels like ancient history now so I can't quite remember probably how I framed it but I was interested in looking at you know natural resource um, and and then human side of things and where that that connected within transformation in the wine industry um, and I was very very focused that I was going to be looking in my own backyard and I was going to be going really deep mm -hmm. in um, in the Willamette Valley. That was my original plan. Um, and I was going to look at uh, a whole bunch of things and you kind of quickly learn, or at least within the first year or two of a PhD program, that that's not really how PhDs work. You don't... Landscape architects, on the other hand, you know, you get a really broad set of skills and knowledge and you don't go as deep so mm -hmm. you might be you know a mile wide and an inch deep in a whole range mm -hmm. of, of of subjects in your phd you are you know an inch wide and a mile deep <laughs> and so that was really challenging for me because that's not always how i think or how i operate so i really my committee and my mentors like spent a lot of time with me like getting me to, to really narrow and focus um because i was like but we can't ask this question without asking these 10 questions <laughs> questions too and they're like okay let's think of someone gave me some really good advice at the beginning they said think of that one thing so you have your 10 questions what's the one question you need to start with in order to answer all of those others okay that's your PhD and then the rest can be you know the rest of your career <laughs> and so that was very useful <laughs> because I, I was really trying to take on um, a lot of themes 
So actually what ended up happening and the way that I was able to focus and um, find um, a path and find a way forward that was doable and uh, meaningful and could get some um, interesting outcomes um, was again, I just, I had this really great opportunity with this grant funding came um, a bucket of money that I couldn't spend on my mortgage or my food or um, it had to be spent on research. Um, and the funny timing of it was that it was going to go away within two years. It had to be spent within the first two years of this five-year plan of mine. So um, the program was sunsetting and um, on the national scale. So that was there was just kind of this time crunch. And I thought, gosh, I just don't even know what my research is going to be yet. How am I going to spend this research money? And then I remembered um, that I like to travel and I like to have fun and I like to have experiences. So I, I designed um, that very first year in school, I designed a series of exploratory research trips to mm -hmm. different wine regions around the world. <laughs> and that's how I spent my research money, which was fantastic and really got me to, you know, not only just kind of dip my toes in about the research methodology and practice doing it, but um, it really helped me learn a lot about the content and focus in on what I, I was then going to go forward and, and really dig more deeply into. So that first year, um, that winter, I went to Napa. And um, then in the spring, over my spring break, plus some, I went to South Africa, to the Western Cape of South Africa. And then in the beginning of summer in June, I went to Australia and I went to um, three different wine regions in Australia. So I just kind of hit the ground. And um, what I did while I was there was um, a series of interviews. And so I talked to um, a broad range of people. I talked to a lot of people in the wine industry. So growers, um, owners, winemakers predominantly, some of the kind of more regional marketing groups as well. Um, and then I also talked to um, natural resource managers, people in government agencies, planners. I talked to people in nonprofit and community-based organizations that were interested in land use stuff or also environmental conservation. Um, so I was trying to get a broad range of perspectives about what was important to these folks in their regions. Um, and I got a lot of information. Um, and at that time, I was doing all the transcription by hand. <laughs> so I was listening to all the interviews, typing out the audio. I don't recommend that to anybody ever. You don't have to do that. There's software to help you with that now. Um, but anyway, I, I, I was able to kind of narrow it down into the, um, into the themes that were really interesting to me. Um, and those ended up being um, climate change, climate change uh, adaptation. They ended up being um, water, water resources. And then this social component of the academic kind of term for governance. So like how... how regions are making decisions about water resources um, and who's making those mm -hmm. decisions and what are the outcomes for um, people at a regional scale. And then as I went forward, I narrowed my focus to and I did a comparative case study between the Willamette Valley. So I stayed st stuck with my original plan to look at my own backyard. And then, um, and then uh, Tasmania in Australia the island state of Australia and looking at their wine region there. So I got to travel to Tasmania um, a number of times after that uh, original trip and uh, and that was the path for doing the research and I completed the degree um, in 2020. During the pandemic I defended my did my dissertation defense by Zoom in my kitchen <laughs> which was you know strange but also kind of it, as all things that we've learned from the pandemic and zoom is that, that it's, it's not ideal in a lot of ways but on the other hand it's much more accessible so a lot of folks were able to attend my defense uh from all over and in different countries than uh than uh would have been possible in person as you expanded, I'm going to come back to 2020, so I have questions about yeah. 2020, but we'll get there. As you expanded your focus out of just the Wyoming Valley and started a, more of a comparison and contrast, tell me what you learned about what's unique about the Willamette Valley and, 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 and what, also, what similarities it had to the other regions you were studying. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what, uh, when I ended up narrowing it down to look at the Willamette Valley and look at Tasmania, um, there, were, there were some things that were in common that were interesting to me. And so um, they're both cool climate grape growing regions. They grow really similar types, uh, varieties of grapes. So Pinot Noir, um, cool climate whites. Tasmania does a lot of sparkling wine um, and the Willamette Valley is doing a lot of that now too. Um, they were also kind of in terms of um, culture and scale. So they were small scale regions that had a real um, uh, connection with their place. They um, both kind of started to, although I'm sure there was grape growing in both regions before, it was kind of you know, the 60s, late 60s, 70s is when it started to, to grow a little bit more and be established. Um, they both have really high quality reputations um, and they also are, in proximity or adjacent to much larger wine grape growing regions that are experiencing some really serious issues around um, climate and natural resources. So in the case of the Lamet Valley, it's California. Mm -hmm. And then in the case of Tasmania, it's the mainland of Australia. Um, and so they're, I, they're both having um, interest and influx. It's not the only reason people are going to those regions, but, but um, future climate is a consideration that a number of um, people who come to these regions and want to establish vineyards and wineries. Um, that, is a, that is a consideration. In Tasmania, they call it the race to Tassie, and um, it was a lot of mainland um, uh, companies were coming down and buying up um, land in, in, this, in this cool climate um, with the anticipation that some of their mainland holdings you know, were going to not be as viable mm -hmm. in future decades. Um, and I know, I, I find, particularly I found that the, when I talk to and interview folks that the larger, um, the larger companies um, often have the ability to think in terms of decades ahead and what their planning is and to invest early on. Some of the smaller scale producers just don't have that capacity. Um, they're just working kind of on a um, year by year, uh, harvest by harvest. I mean, they d people definitely do planning and, and mm -hmm. thinking ahead, but, um, but sometimes the, the monetary ability to invest and um, to think about things like water rights and water availability. And um, so those were kind of two, those were the types of things that were coming up in these two different regions that was interesting to me. I think that the cultural shifts that were happening um, in, both of the, in both Tasmania and in um, the Willamette Valley. But I think that there was also Attit uh, so I'm a social scientist, and so the attitudes, the perceptions, the opinions, the wh why people think what they think um, is also really mm -hmm. interesting to me. Um, so obviously things are changing pretty rapidly here, and we all just went through, you know, the worst heat wave that we've had in the Lemon Valley just earlier this week. Um, but, you know, this region for a long time was just known as like, why would water be an, an issue here? Like, we have plenty of water, it rains here. Like, it's just not on the forefront of mm -hmm. something that people are considering when they have, you know, tons of other things to be considering about their business and about their farming practices. And the same was in Tasmania, it was kind of known as being, you know, cooler. But when the reality came down to it, it actually was probably something that everybody needed to begin to be thinking about and planning for. And I just also think that's such a great opportunity. I think that we're very often uh, reactive and um, don't actually, um, deal with some of these bigger scale challenges um, or things that might be coming at us at a regional scale um, until it's a bit too late. And so we can learn from our neighbors to the south or in, in Tasmania, their neighbors to the north and see like, ah, the writing is kind of on the wall of some of the shifts that might be happening mm -hmm. and what can we learn from what they're experiencing and put into place in our region um, or at least start talking about um, before we reach those um, really challenging times. Mm -hmm. So water was a big one for me in both of those regions where it wasn't necessarily something that people were on the forefront of their mind feeling like we need to urgently deal with this, um, yet it mm -hmm. is already starting to be something that um, needs to be paid attention to and will continue to be in the coming decades. Mm -hmm. So I found that pretty interesting about both regions. And also in terms of just visiting some of the other regions in Australia and South Africa, I mean, South Africa, 
big time water issues um, and climate change. And then linking that in with what does that mean for the social, um, the social side of things for the people who mm -hmm. are living and working. The people also who aren't in the wine industry mm -hmm. who are living and working in those mm -hmm. regions because we exist, you know, within a larger community. Um, yeah. You talked about getting audio, audio research being interviews on, on, on as, as someone who does that for a living. I, I know the challenges that they go into that. So tell me about deciding what to ask, deciding who to ask, and then actually making that happen. Tell me about the research part of this for yeah, you. Yeah, that part was actually the most rewarding part and the most fun and just an absolute delight. Um, honestly, each person I interviewed was just so generous of spirit and time. I would often go to somebody's vineyard and they would spend hours with me, touring me around, answering my questions, just super generous. And then they would send me home with their wine. <laughs> like, like just incredibly wonderful people. Um, and I, I mean, I have tons of anecdotes of some really fun and strange experiences. Um, I'll tell you one of um, when I went to Napa and uh, I was really just kind of faking it until you make it. I hadn't done this before. I didn't quite know what I was doing. Um, but I, you know, I'd had some um, good, you know, pep talks with my committee and uh, they were like, just be natural, be yourself. Just, you have your questions. Um, you don't have to go through each of your questions and make sure everybody answers every single thing. Just, it'll flow, mm -hmm. it'll be natural. There'll be follow-up questions and uh, just see how it goes. And so um, after I had my very first interview in Napa, I left that interview. It was actually with a woman who was um, the head of an environmental conservation nonprofit down there, but she was also a college nurse. And so I met her on campus at the college there and uh, interviewed her. And when I left, I just, I felt elated. I just felt so, excited. I felt like I had learned so much. I had had this human connection and I just thought, this is what I want to be doing with my time and my life. This is amazing. And so I had a number of great interviews during that time in Napa, but um, one interview was with a, a winemaker and he had retired and he, his son, who was his adult son and, and daughter-in-law were running the the operations at that point. So I had also interviewed them and I didn't think he wanted to be interviewed, although I had invited him and he was kind of hanging around and was, was on the property and um, he didn't really want to talk to me all that much formally and he didn't want me to record him. But he did say that, that as I was leaving, he said, um, are you free tomorrow morning? Can you meet me at the airfield at, um, at 9 a.m. or something? And I said, okay, and yes. And he had his own plane, like just a small plane, and he was really passionate about hillside vineyard development in Napa, um, and that it was, it was harmful, and that it was getting out of control, and that it was, um, there was a lot of negative ecological impacts. And it was also a real concern about um, groundwater, that if they were removing all of these trees and putting in vineyards. So he really wanted me to, to see what this development was. And he thought the best way I could see it was to take me up in his plane and tour me around. And it was amazing. And it was so generous. And it was just, he felt passionate about it. And he had been very involved in that issue in his region and he invited me to go do that. So I had so many just positive experiences like that um, in South Africa, um, in Australia. The Tasmanians are just amazing. And even, I mean, I didn't just talk to people in the wine industry, so I was doing a lot of going to, um, you know, government agencies and same, like I just, I, <laughs> there's a very chatty crow over there. Um, I had a great experience uh, interviewing the land use planner for all of the Western Cape. He was one man who was in charge of this huge region and he was kind of describing it as like death by a thousand paper cuts of people wanting to develop mm -hmm. in areas that they were trying to conserve and particularly because of the water resource issues, they just did not have the capacity to do a lot of development, whether it be agricultural or, or, or not, or residential or, or commercial. But um, when, he, when he got up to leave, I had to continue on to do another interview somewhere else. And um, 
he, we had talked for two hours. We had been scheduled to talk for one hour. And um, I kind of realized that it felt like it had turned into a counseling session where he just really needed somebody to talk to. That he walked me out um, to the elevator and I thought that we would part ways there. And then he got in the elevator and came down with me and kept talking. And then I thought we'd part ways there. And he walked me to the front door of the government building. And then he walked me all the way out to the parking lot to my rental car and opened the door and got me in the car. And I kind of thought he was going to get in the car <laughs> with me. But then we parted ways but it didn't, yeah there were just a lot of um i think that the logistics side was always kind of i mean i had to figure out where i was going i often had to drive on the other side of the road which i had done in my life before um navigating just um yeah engaging with people in their places as you get to do a lot with this project so um and the questions that i asked you asked me about that um yeah, those were all thought through like pretty in depth um, in an academic way with my um, my committee and getting a lot of sign offs and, and approvals. Um, but really, they were honed in on kind of these key themes that I was interested in, but also really um, keeping things open ended. So other themes could emerge if possibly. Um, and then my my process when I would get back would be to um, well, I don't need to go into the academic. <laughs> <laughs> like how you analyzed it. That's not very interesting, but um, but it was part of it, was then going back through and actually um, trying to learn, like mm -hmm. beyond just anecdotally, what did somebody say about mm -hmm. their impression of, you know, water resources in their region? It was like, what is the meaning mm -hmm. of, the, of, of all of this information? Mm -hmm. Are there trends? Are there outliers? Are, um, and then in my work, I combined it with a lot of other people's research, so really digging deep into, you know, what are the climate projections for this region? Um, and and work, you know, working with other people's data about climate science, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then learning a lot about the, um, the water rights and the water governance side of things. So a lot of the institutional information too. So that was all being woven together along with these, um, these really deep in-depth qualitative interviews um, getting um, personal experience and perceptions included in there in addition to the themes that you were you were kind of focused on or thinking about going in were there similarities among the conversations you had were there things that came up that you weren't expecting that came up over and over again or that sort of tied the regions together yeah um I think the differences were pretty interesting to me between the two regions. And of course the differences within the regions as well. There's a range of attitudes and perceptions and approaches. Um, and so in Tasmania, for example, um, and in Australia in general, like water is a commodity. So there's water markets. You can buy, sell, and trade water. Um, I mean, the state and the people own it, but that, but it's it's um, in it, it's uh, controlled and regulated and used in a really more of like a like a stock market, like a. So that has its own issues. But there's um, really seeing. Um, viticulture and agriculture and and water as a commodity all of this everything was really focused towards like what is the economic good of this place and mm -hmm. so that's not the the opinion or impression of the entire state of tasmanians i'm not trying to say but that was kind of a general theme and trend um, in oregon it's a little bit different there's definitely people who are interested in that as a future for water in oregon um, i found that um, there was a lot, particularly around kind of the natural resource side of things, there was a lot of lot less of a regional approach to thinking about it and a lot more of a site specific, like what's happening on my vineyard? Where's my water coming from? Where, you know, what's the issue in land use with my neighbor? It was um, not necessarily thinking of it in systems or um, in a regional level. Um, yeah, those are kind of some of the things that I think that the other things that came up that I would love to do more um, digging into is um, I think there's been a, a lot of interest, particularly on the grape grower side, of thinking about what to do um, around climate challenges, um, particularly related to growing your grapes. Um, so it's a lot focused on, you know, the horticulture and the farming techniques and approaches and, you know, 
what cultivar and what clone and what, you know, what do we do with canopy management? And it's just, which is, I think, great and totally needs to be researched and totally needs to be um, part of this. I'm really interested in this. So what does this mean for people? Um, and so I think that there's just a lot of opportunity to um, either link those things or, or be doing them kind of side by side. Um, so what, um, and particularly as we see some of these really challenging things coming up with, um, with wildfire smoke, with extreme weather experiences, um, and thinking about, you know, who's working um, in these conditions, um, what does it mean for, uh, if, if we're, you know, thinking about water regionally, like who's getting access, who's not, mm -hmm. or even thinking about things from an equity side in terms of land access. So as we consolidate as bigger companies that have more resources come in, like who's able to access land it, for vineyards, but also for other things. And so um, I think some of those social issues that have to do with uh, politics, with economics, with culture, with um, all of these things are really fascinating and are things that we can keep exploring in our wine region um, as we go forward, in addition to um, really the horticulture mm -hmm. side of things. Well, you mentioned one of the parts of your project was talking to people in the region, but not, <clears throat> not in the industry, or not necessarily beholden to the industry. I'm curious, um, you, obviously you're talking about two regions on a kind of a similar timeline and, and dealing with a lot of similar changes and similar scales. Tell me about the reactions you got from people who were in the region but not in the industry, about the industry's growth and about its impact and about its future. Were they similar? Were they positive? Were they negative? Mm. Um, all of the above. <laughs> there were a lot of different perspectives for sure. Um, I, there were positive impressions in terms of this is going to be a, a great economic driver for us. If we invest, if, if these types of companies are coming here, it's going to be um, really positive. Um, it's going to provide jobs, um, that type of thing. I think that there was definitely a little bit of like, what is this going to mean for me? Like if I'm a sheep farmer and I can't afford land or that type of thing, um, that, that that can be an issue um, in terms of maybe competition. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I think that for the most part, um, the people that I engaged with, there were definitely some of the environmental conservation folks who were concerned um, and not concerned necessarily about the fact that people are grape farming, but it had a little bit more to do with how people were grape farming. So if it was um, a larger, more conventional farming operation, people were worried about water culture, about um, destruction of habitat, about, um, or water quality, I should say, and destruction of habitat and things like that. Um, but they weren't necessarily wholesale, like against the wine industry <laughs> coming in. And a lot of them um, were curious about it and um, excited about it. And another huge piece of it the, on the social side especially is tourism mm -hmm. and so um, there were a lot of questions which I know we have in the Willamette Valley that come up um, and we compare ourselves to like different rules and policy and regulation around land use and um, uh, you know can you have a restaurant can you have a tour bus can you in these rural agricultural areas so those types of um, that friction mm -hmm. was definitely in, in all of the regions mm -hmm. that I talked to. Well, maybe a little bit less in South Africa. I didn't get into it as much there, but yeah. So there, there were some of those challenges mm -hmm. definitely were um, present. Tell me about the conclusions that you drew uh, and uh, the sort of when you did present your thesis and defend your thesis, what, what were the conclusions you drew and, and what were the areas beyond what you've talked about that you wanted to continue studying? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that, I think that the, the kind of the main things, I guess I didn't get too much into what I actually discovered, which is what you're asking, but um, I think because of the, I think that, let's see if I can say this concisely. <laughs> then you could go read the dissertation. <laughs> um, just kidding. Um, I think that um, one of the things was the opportunity to really think regionally 
and to think in a systems way. So to think, you know, not just isolated to what I'm doing on my individual vineyard. And my dissertation looked really, really broadly at, at a regional scale. I didn't dive really deeply into individual vineyard scales, although there are some kind of narrative vignettes in there that do. Um, so one of them was that. The other was really just getting more engaged with what's going on um, in a kind of political agency, government agency way. So for example, there's a real mismatch in our state between land use, who manages land use, the county, and who manages water, the state. And so if you're developing a new site, you can get your land use approvals um, without having to make any sort of, you know, you don't have to confirm that you're going to be able to have enough water there to do what you need to do. And all of the water stuff gets taken care of in a completely separate department and they don't talk to each other. So not that we as individuals can fix that, but um, as, a, as a community and as a culture and as a society, like, how are we going to have more transparency, connection, collaboration as we have less land because more people are, or I should say, not we'll have the same amount of land, but you know, it'll be more people wanting the same thing um, and less resources potentially going forward. So if we're thinking about a future for Oregon that has high demand for land, um, while we're having a diminishing resource like water because of climate change, um, what are our systems in place in terms of how we're making decisions as a society, as, as our community around our water, for example. So that sounds like a very like academic nebulous, not, but, but it's, it's trying to think about systems, about relationships, about connections. And I think as a wine industry, start to ha having these conversations, like um, what does it mean beyond just, you know, farming sustainably to, um, you know, have a marketable product for consumers because they want that. Like, how do we actually take care of our patch of land and our planet connected with one another in a way that's good for our land in the long term and good for our people in the long term? So really thinking about those social equity connections mm -hmm. too. Um, and then, I mean, just some of the other conclusions were things like, um, uh, you know, how do you engage with boundary organizations? So boundary org organizations might be something like LIVE, which, um, you know, low input viticulture analogy. Mm -hmm. So like they are a great, you know, organization that's a third party that can connect, you know, people um, growing grapes and, and having wineries with some of these other desirable outcomes that they want. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a number of other approaches to that, community-based organizations, nonprofits, academic institutions, community colleges, like s getting students involved in things, like how do we like continue on with um, approaches around education, approaches um, around practice, um, I mean, like Oregon State Extension is just an amazing resource for the wine industry. So how do we like continue connecting um, is a really important outcome and um, or consideration. Um, but really, I think, I mean, it comes down to it for me, like we just need to be talking about it more. Um, we need to be engaging with it more. We need to, um, we'll have different opinions. Like there's gonna be the people who are like, we are putting in irrigation and this is what, we need to, in order to grow the grapes and produce what we want. And then there are going to be the people, um, say, like the Deep Roots Coalition, they're like, we will never irrigate. It has to do with quality. So there's, there's, there's going to be different opinions. But ultimately, we're all on the same pa patch of planet with the same resources. So how are we going to sort out so we can have it in an equitable way um, uh, as our future in, in the Willamette Valley? One of the things that's unique about the Oregon wine industry, at least, or, is how many small entities there are within it, right? How many people are one person or maybe a couple or a family that are, are doing everything. So I'm curious, when you have an industry like that with very few large players and a lot of small players, who leads the conversation and who has the influence to make an impact? Excellent question. I mean, I have my personal opinions, but I don't. That doesn't mean they're right. But I think that um, I think that the entities like the Oregon Wine Board and the Oregon Wine Grape Growers Association, and it doesn't have to just be at a state level. There's so many of like all of the the AVA. Um, you know, the there's different um, groups that are organized around 
um, supporting, mm -hmm. uh, educating, promoting. Um, and I think there, it, it's not that we need, there need to be more of those. I think we just need to continue in that way and also make sure everybody's included and, and, and think about who's in leadership in those spaces and who's actually making decisions um, and who's contributing. Are people able to contribute their voices in a real um, meaningful and equitable way? Mm -hmm. um, and the answer might be yes, <laughs> they are already. I'm not trying to knock any of the, um, the organizations. They're probably doing a great job. I'm not that deeply involved with it. But I do think that, that they have that role to play mm -hmm. um, in supporting. Because the people who um, are just you know operating on a smaller scale, like they they need the support and resources to, to be thinking about long-term planning, to be thinking about, um, to be thinking about what do they need to, to, new things they might, new knowledge they might need to have as things shift with climate or, th you know, so having those, those support systems and networks in place, um, it's not just a, everybody for themselves. And I think that the Oregon wine industry is really set up well to do that because, um, observing this region i mean as i mentioned earlier about the competition like they were already set up maybe differently i haven't deeply researched other crops but i don't know i imagine there's i mean there's already this community um, and collaborative um, nature of this industry um, which i think just makes it well positioned to continue to tackle some of these challenging things around social issues and around ecological issues. Mm -hmm. And again, not everyone has the same opinion or is going to come to the same outcomes or conclusions, but um, I, think it, I think that in terms of what is this region going to become, like, we really have to have that conversation of what do we want to see it? Uh, how do we want to experience it? How do we want our neighbors to experience it? How do we want our visitors to experience it? How do we want our kids to experience it? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, not just thinking about how many bottles of wine can we sell. Obviously, that is a big component of it for, to be able to continue. But um, yeah, there's a lot of, I just think there's a lot of thought and conversation that can continue in that vein. Speaking specifically about Oregon wine industry and, and during your research, where did you find how much sort of engagement or thought did you find people had given to the questions you were asking? And what was their general perspective uh, in terms of the future? Was it fairly optimistic, fairly pessimistic, or, or somewhere in the middle? Mm -hmm. um, it ranged. It really varied who I talked to. Um, I, I think a lot of growers I talked to, it was kind of like, well, we'll just irrigate when we need to. Yeah. And I would think, well, where are you going to get the water from. Well, I think one thing I didn't go into too deeply in this is that a lot of my research was really focused on water access and water rights. Who has water rights in Oregon? How do water rights work? Who has access? Um, and how is that may going to maybe potentially shift and change in the future? So I think that was a question that a lot of folks weren't necessarily, I'll, I'll rephrase that. Uh, some of the people that I, for example, that I interviewed who had recently acquired property and had come from California, I mean, there was just no question to them that that was what they had to deal with immediately, it was just to make sure they knew that they had a water right, that they were able to put in a pond and, you know, take in the winter to be able to irrigate in the summer when you're not allowed to take. Like, the, there aren't any you know, surface water rights left in the land. Like you can't get them unless you buy the, buy the property that has them. Um, and, and so it was just kind of interesting to, there were really different approaches. There were people that just insisted they were only going to irrigate, you know, during establishment and then they, but for me it was kind of interesting to also see them start connecting um, as we would be talking and think, oh yeah, it's kind of beyond just irrigation. When we think about water in our region, it's not just about, are you going to put some water on this plant or not? It was, oh, like we have this whole system, this whole industry that relies on this resource, like whether it's tourism and, you know, washing dishes and flushing toilets or whether it's, you know, the tasting room or the operations um, in the cellar, you know, there or, you know, fish habitat because you have, you know, there's regulations or whatever it is, like it's um, going to be something that is, um, is important to consider um, whether you're going to irrigate or not, but that didn't exactly answer your question. I think that the, um, 
I think that there was uh, both. There was pessimism for sure about climate and a lot of you know ch fears around challenges, particularly with wildfire smoke in both regions. I mean, it's a major issue in all of the regions that I studied. Um, there was uncertainty about, particularly from the smaller scale folks, about um, you know consolidation and and competition from you know corporate entities. Um, there's, I mean, the one that always comes up is, is kind of this land use um, friction with what you're, you're allowed to do um, in your agriculturally zoned area. Um, there's tons of optimism. I mean, people are passionate about wine and about growing uh, grapes and making wine, and so there's a lot of positivity. It was all of the above. Mm. So tell me about, we talked earlier about, about 2020 and about its, uh, its sort of impact on you educationally. <laughs> I'm curious, uh, tell me about uh, pandemic hits in the spring, tell me about sort of your personal and sort of professional response to it in the moment, mm -hmm. um, adjustments you had to make and, uh, and sort of how you made it through the year. <laughs> yeah, wow, what a year it was for everybody. Um, I guess I was doing a final trip to Tasmania um, in February. I had just, I had gone to a, I was invited to a convening on a ranch in California in January that was all about regenerative viticulture, which was fascinating and informative and interesting. So I had gone straight from there to a trip to Tasmania where I was doing some um, final kind of ground truthing of my research and was able to do some presenting um, to folks out there and which was just an amazing connection but all of the COVID stuff was starting to happen and actually a lot of the university students um, some of my colleagues uh, that I engaged a lot with were at the University of Tasmania um, in Hobart and a lot of their students um, were from China and they got all returned home for the holiday and then got stuck because they weren't allowed to travel back. So it was starting to be more of something we were paying attention to, mainly because these folks were trying to figure out what to do with these huge amounts of students that they were trying to do virtual classes with all of a sudden. Um, and then I think I got back to the States um, in early March and then I, I remember because I thought, oh, I'm, I'm kind of jet lagged. I've got, you know, I'm just going to stick around home this week and not make any plans and just like chill. <laughs> and then the lockdown happened. I was like, and now I'm just going to be here indefinitely. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a, in a way, I mean, my plan that spring was I needed to just sit at my desk and write my dissertation, uh, which felt extremely daunting. And I didn't quite know how that was going to unfold. Um, so in a way it didn't change too much for me. I was doing that anyway. And then I um, defended my, my dissertation that I mentioned. And then, um, yeah, it was, I then spent the rest of the year uh, looking for a job. So that was challenging in, um, in particularly in kind of the direction I was interested in going in, which would involve a lot of networking and, um, you know, having coffee with people. And so people were just, understandably fatigued of trying to do meetings on Zoom. And it's just, it was, so there was, it was a bit of a heavy lift to do a job search during that time. Um, but I did end up making a good connection, um, which did end up turning into a full-time position. Um, and I work with a consulting firm. I live in Portland, so I work in a consulting firm that's based in Portland. Um, using my social science research skills, I spent a lot of time interviewing people. Um, I currently don't do anything directly connected uh, with the wine industry, but I think that's going to shift. Um, but I do get to do work that's still connected in the natural resource world. I'm working on a really fun project with the Metro government mm -hmm. um, around their parks and nature projects and programs, um, working with their staff on um, some really interesting kind of program development work. So was, that was kind of more my landscape architect uh, background coming forward. Um, so yeah, I'm still, I'm still really curious about a lot of, um, of these questions and it, it would be really fun to continue doing research and work um, around wine regions and around Oregon wine regions. Um, 
it's a little I'm I'm a little like I mentioned before I'm just open to seeing how that unfolds mm -hmm. I know that I'm not interested in um, being in academia like in a traditional role and like heading towards you know tenured professorship that's just not my path um, so it will definitely unfold in a different way um, mm -hmm. and we'll see what that is Well, on that note, um, as you do look ahead for yourself, uh, what do you hope for? What are you looking forward to? And um, what, what's what's coming down the path now that we're sort of starting to come out of the pandemic? Oh, I know. Well, it's been really nice to hug people. <laughs> I've appreciated that <laughs> with being fully vaccinated and just feel very lucky about that. Um, uh, yeah, I... I'm really hopeful that um, we'll be able to continue, I guess just kind of on a general level, to continue to make progress and have these hard conversations, particularly around things around social equity um, in our industry. Um, and I'm just, I don't work directly in the wine industry right now, um, but I still, you know, feel a lot of like connection and camaraderie with it. So I'll say our industry. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, there's a, a lot of movement. There's a lot of interest, um, but I also think that we have, like I mentioned before, just a lot to think about um, in the region um, around land use issues, around how are we farming and um, how are we taking care of our water and our natural resources. So um, I don't know how that's going to connect in. I have a lot of uh, a lot of research ideas. Um, I have a number of um, you know collaborators who are interested in maybe doing some stuff around soil, um, but I, I'm really I would love to keep doing social science research in this realm of like what does this mean for people? What are attitudes, perceptions, ideas? How does it impact behaviors? Um, and I think climate change. I mean, this is it right now, right? If we're thinking about climate, we're thinking about human health, we're thinking about planet health. Um, and how does that all connect in with our industry? Um, all of those things still really spark me. So mm -hmm. for me, for the future, I just want to continue to be curious, be continue to have opportunity to um, do inquiry and try to make some meaning and connections about through learning and share ideas. Um, you talked about uh, kind of seeing some of the changes from the industry while you're studying it since your kind of initial interest in Oregon wine or since your in initial time in the industry what are the changes you've seen that are most noticeable to you uh, what does the industry look like now versus when you started <coughs> and not necessarily, not necessarily taking credit for the, uh, with what you're studying oh, sorry let me rephrase that I don't necessarily want you to say that it was because of something you did or didn't do, but have you seen some of the changes coming are, that are the things you're concerned about? Have you seen people taking these things more seriously than they were before? Okay. Um, so I guess one of the main changes that I've observed is uh, consolidation and uh, outside investment. I mean, that's always been happening, but it, it appears to be continuing and rapid. Um, the growth doesn't seem to have slowed. Um, and um, so, yeah, I think it, it, it kind of heightens and accelerates some of these potential challenges that we're going to um, have. But on the other hand, it also presents opportunities. I've definitely noticed that a lot of the larger companies have the resources, both in our region and in other regions, and do some really um, innovative and forward thinking um, practices and approaches and have a lot to contribute there um, and I'm not just talking about technological fixes I'm actually talking about setting up social systems um, and thinking about things in like the whole more holistic way of thinking about an ecosystem or ecology because um, there are a lot of interesting technologies out there technological fixes um, but I don't think that's going to be the answer mm -hmm. so I think that some of these larger companies do have a role to play um, but it will also you know time will tell <laughs> about what that what, how does that um, impact our region uh, culturally um, one of the things I'll just say 
this isn't exactly in response to your question, but it just made me think of this was one of the changes in Tasmania with having this kind of um, large companies and, and more corporate entities um, purchasing land is that it's transformed some of the production. And that might be specifically because they're an island too. But um, instead of necessarily investing in making the wine in a larger scale on the island of Tasmania, they've uh, tended to press the grapes, take the juice in tanker trucks on the ferry up to the mainland and actually make the wine in their facilities on the mainland. And so the grapes have really, in these larger companies turned into more of just a commodity crop, which really decouples it from this experiential, like you, the wine is of this place and you visit, you know, what they call their cellar door or their tasting room and you, it was made here, it was grown here, here are the people who did it and you experience it here. Um, it's just a different model. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not trying to put a value judgment on it, but it's just a question to pose out to everybody of like, what do you want this place to be? Um, so as we think about consolidation, I think that's one of those questions. Um, I definitely, and maybe it's just the people that I am drawn to, like I am so inspired by what a lot of people are doing in terms of, of their farming practices, but also starting to think about um, uh, the social justice side of things in their in their operations and so that means health insurance for workers and all of your workers including farm workers that means um, how are you treating your um, your farmland in a whole systems way um, that means getting in, engaged um, in your community in other ways that means um, uh, all sorts of things that people are just doing really cool, inspiring stuff. And I definitely see looking at things on a regional systems. So we have regional food ways. We have region, we th if we could think about water in our regional scale, if we think about, we already have wine in our regional scale. If we think about, you know, how do we connect with younger people? There's this great stuff going on at Linfield College getting, you know, college students engaged and there's great stuff going on at Chemeketa getting community college students engaged like there's just there's so many neat programs out there um, that I think that that gives me a lot of hope for the the directionality that we could we could go in mm -hmm. in the future mm -hmm. um, yeah those are some of the thoughts that come to mind We've talked a lot about, obviously, the sort of environmental and water and those kind of impacts, but obviously you keep coming back to social and keep coming back to people. Yeah. So we're at kind of a interesting crossroads now uh, with sort of social movements I here. I'm curious, inside the wine industry, what have, specifically when it comes to social movements, you talked a little bit about sort of worker rights and worker, worker compensation. Um, what else have you seen and what do you see for the future of the Oregon wine industry? If it's going to be successful, what what will what will happen when it comes to the social part of the industry? Mm. Representation. Um, we're starting to see that a tiny bit, um, but you know, just more diversity, more people from different backgrounds, um, BIPOC communities, um, gender. I, there's just, I'm so inspired by um, all the women winemakers and grape growers and all the various other roles that people play but there's uh, I think that that is shifting and in terms of gender equity um, I'm really this uh, health and well-being of all workers um, is really kind of sticking with me right now thinking through you know not only the pandemic the wildfires um, you know the deep freeze the extreme heat like all of these th I just if we don't value all of the people who are contributing to the success of this and invest in and deeply care for them and their families and all of the ripple effects like i just i don't think we can have a conscience as as an industry and so it needs to be beyond just having you know like every, everyone is doing a lot of people are participating in great efforts, um, but I think that we need to have systems in place. It can't just be a fundraiser. It can't just be, like, I think we need to be thinking on policy, governance, systems, and that can't just be up to the wine industry. I know it has to engage with um, different levels of government, other groups of people, neighbors, regions. Um, but I think that that's really important to consider in terms of our, our, our social well-being. We have to think about 
economics, we have to think about health. Um, yeah. Um, perfect. Well, I actually have one more question for you, so <laughs> we're going to get a little philosophical for you. I'm really curious about your answer on this, given your perspectives and, and where you've studied. So, from your perspective, what is the role of wine in society? Um, hmm. I haven't really thought about it in that way before. The role of wine in society. I guess I have multiple answers, but... Um, maybe I'll leave it at the, at the philosophical uh, level. I think that it, wine has the ability to bring us together. No, that sounds really cheesy. That's not really what I mean. When we're together, when we're, um, let's say you're, you're having a difficult time and you need soothing and support um, it's people it's the people but having wine is also um, a connector <laughs> I don't know if this is making any sense because to me I don't know if it's making sense in my head but there's a way that I mean wine can be a celebration wine can be um, you know something shared that's fun wine can be you know there as you're having a really deep conversation. It doesn't have to be there, but there is something special about it. Um, and there is something social about it. Um, and then there is something really special about place, like that I remember going to pick grapes of the Beaujolais when I was 19, you know, like, I don't think I would have been that into going and picking broccoli or something. <laughs> like there is like, you know, a, there's a cultural component to it that um, is really intriguing. Um, I think in terms of a business or in terms of commodity or in terms of um, like, yeah, we could probably live in a world without wine, wine and wine grapes. There's like other things to drink. There's other things to grow. There's other things to spend your time doing. But obviously, since we're all here, um, there is something that's probably um, pretty different and unique and special because there is this really cultural component. And to tie it back in, like there is this connection between people and place that, that we really get um, in wine regions. All right. That's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? No, thank you for the opportunity to um, talk with you and to share some of these experiences. Um, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to share with us and talk about all the work you've done and, and share your story with us. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Okay. Thanks, Rich.